Walter, you're a physicalist, but you believe in downward causation. Uh, that's normally something that uh, people who are theists believe in. Um, how can you justify downward causation? Well, first you got to get straight about the notion of causation. Some people think that causation is like one pool ball hitting another pool ball and sending energy to the second pool ball. But that's just way too simple a notion of causation. It's too simple in, in two ways. Uh, one way is that some causal relations don't even involve contact. When the moon causes the tides, the moon doesn't touch the water that constitutes the tides. The second way in which it's too simple is that you think of one thing causing another when actually it's one thing as opposed to something else causing this thing, other thing, as opposed to yet another thing. So there are four objects involved. Let me give you an example. If a pebble hits your windshield and causes a crack, you could say that the fact that it was a pebble as opposed to a grain of sand caused there to be a crack instead of nothing. But the fact that it was a pebble as opposed to a rock caused it to be a crack instead of shattering. So to really understand causation, you got to get all four things straight. That's a contrasting, so you have to do causation by a contrast. Exactly. Contrastivism says that causal relations involve four different things, uh, not just two. And you can't understand causation unless you have this contrastivistic uh, view? Well, you can't understand it properly. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, to fully understand it and to understand it properly, I think you need this contrastive notion. Right, let, let and that me, takes a general argument. All right, so let, let me give it to you. And yeah. now, how, how do you drive downward causation given those premises? Well, the idea is that abstract things can then cause concrete physical things. If you want a Coke, and there's a Coke machine that needs takes a dollar for a Coke, and you don't have any money, and you turn to me and say, you know, I'd like to buy a Coke, uh, and I look in my pocket and I've got four quarters and uh, two half dollars. Well, I could give you four quarters, or I could give you two half dollars, or I could give you a half dollar and two quarters, uh, but let's suppose I give you four quarters and you say thank you and buy your Coke. Well, what caused you to say thank you? Uh, was it the fact that I gave you four quarters? Not really, because if I hadn't given you four quarters, I'd just given you two half dollars, you still would have said thank you. So what causes you to say thank you is that I gave you a dollar. But a dollar is an abstract thing that might take the form of four quarters or two half dollars or a half dollar and two quarters. So it's the abstract thing, me giving you a dollar, that is the best causal account of why you said thank you. And then I just take that model and apply it to the mind. Mental states can also be abstract. The same memory of the shower scene in Psycho that makes me shake. Well, that memory can be instantiated in different neural patterns sure. at different points in the brain. But it's the fact that I'm remembering the shower scene that causes me to shake because no matter which of those particular instantiations of the mental state occurred, it still would have caused me to shake because that scene always makes me shake. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. But, but it's still, it, it has to be, the, the, these general concepts have to be described and reduced to neural activity. There's nothing else going on there, certainly in your view. Well, they have to be uh, instantiated in something. You can't have a memory of the shower scene without some neural pattern or other. But the point is that the causal relation exists at the higher level of generality, remembering the shower scene instead of at the lower level of gen sure, generality, this particular pattern of neural fact. Right, so, so what you're saying is there are many different, uh, maybe a very large number of potential neural activities that can generate that same, that same emotion. Exactly, it's called the multiple realizability. The same mental state can get realized in different neural states. Right. Uh, but at the end of the day, they're all neural states. So are, yes. you, are you really adding anything by doing that? I'm not adding any new entity. I'm a physicalist. I think every mental state has to be instantiated in a physical state. But I am adding a new level of description, a new way of classifying mental, uh, physical states or neural states uh, that did not exist without the mental terminology. And that mental terminology, that new classification, produces new causal laws that then get uh, explained and help us explain 
what happens in the physical world as well as the mental world. But all of those new causal laws have to be have to ultimately be reduced to neural activity. Well, they have to be instantiated. I don't want to reduce the notion of a dollar to four quarters because there's an infinite array of other possible sets of coins. Infinite because you can always have a, a coin worth 3.12784. Sure, sure, sure. Right. But, but that's in your analogy. I want to stick to the actual brain because we're talking about mental states. Sure. And so you so you have you have to deal with what's real in the brain and that's neuronal activity. And that's neuronal activity but the same mental state can be instantiated in different sets of neurons connected in different ways. Correct. Just take for example sure. the memory of the shower scene in Psycho. Well, if you try to reduce it to the particular activity in my brain at this moment, while I'm now remembering the shower scene, you're not going to be able to reduce it because I can have the same memory with different neurons connected in different ways, firing at different rates, but it's still going to count as a memory of the shower scene. Sure, uh, but there's, there's a fi maybe a large number, but there's a finite number of those that describe that or different ways that it can occur. And so, the, and so they have to, in order for that shower scene instantiated in different kinds of neurons to have an, an, an emotional impact on you, uh, it has to go through the neural process. Yes, absolutely. It has to be one of a certain, uh, a certain limited set of possibilities. Okay. But that limited set includes a tremendous number of possible Granted. firings. So, uh, assuming this to be true, that you can have these mental categories that are real and uh, have causative power, you're, you're, giving, you're imbuing them with causative power mm -hmm. in, in the mind, and, and therefore the mind can... What, what, what's the implication of that? Well, the implication is that if you take something like my shaking from having remembered the shower scene, because now I feel fear and my amygdala is firing, mm -hmm. and that makes my body shake, well, what caused all of that? Well, in one sense, what caused it is certain neurons, maybe in my hippocampus or wherever, that uh, are the memory, uh, the way the memory is realized on this particular occasion. And that explains why I shake maybe at this rate instead of this rate, which is slightly different. But the fact that I remember the shower scene instead of remembering the sound of music means that I shake instead of getting uplifted. Uh, and so the mental state explains why I have my reaction of shaking as opposed to one alternative, whereas the physical cause explains why I have that reaction as opposed to a different alternative. So both the mental description and the physical description have a role to play in the causal account of what happened, but they have different roles to play relative to different contrast classes. And if you don't think in terms of contrastive causation, you'll miss all of that. And then mental causation will look like a mystery when really there's a perfectly good explanation of it.